Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be trying to sell you uh, some, uh, a kind of algebra that I was working on 20 years ago now, but it still, still has mm -hmm. interesting things in in which information flows down braid and not diamond. Okay. So, and I'll show you that it's really, I, I claimed back in the 1990s that, that this was the true algebra underlying things called quantum groups, and I still believe that, and I'll show you some examples. But really, it's an interesting gadget just by itself, uh, even if you don't know about quantum groups. So, the basic setting is that of a Brady category introduced by Joy Allen Street. Um, so, a category of objects, a sense of product of any two objects, then between any three objects, you should be able to rebracket. So this means the phi's are the rebracketing isomorphisms, a natural equivalent between these two functors. And that means that for every three objects have got an isomorphism. Um, however, the theorem of McLean says that in a monoidal category, so that's a monoidal category, but objects are tensor product and phi. And the theorem of McLean says that a monoidal category is as good as ones where you can forget about phi and assume that all the brackets are associative and then you can always insert phi as needed to make for things to make sense. And the different ways to do that will always give you the same answer. That's the case for here and here. Therefore, throughout this talk, I shall forget about phi. Okay, but in order to make sense of diagrams, you'll have to insert phi. Now, in a, monoidal, in a braided monoidal category, you've got a monoidal category like that, and in addition, between any two objects, you've got an isomorphism between V tensor W and W tensor V. This is the, this is the tensor product Flipped. So that means, um, okay, now we're going to use the diagrammatic notation in which information flows down the page and in which we don't write tensor products. So VW means V tensor W. And so the braiding between V tensor W and W tensor V, which is V tensor W opposite, is between V tensor W and W tensor V, I'm going to draw as a braid plot. And I'm not going to assume that if you square psi, you get the identity. Obviously, if you category of vector spaces, two vector spaces, V tensor W, are, and W tensor V are isomorphic. And if you identify them by the flip, and if you do the flip twice, you get back to where you started. But in a Brady category, we don't assume that. So the inverse, which is uh, of psi of W, V, which is also a map from V tensor W to W tensor V, I'll draw with the inverse Brady. And we'll see why in a second. Now, there's a whole lot of axioms that Joel and Street wrote out. Um, the pentagon is obeyed by phi, I already mentioned, but I didn't mention it, but there's a pentagon in the phi. But in concerning psi, there's, um, there's something where if you regard psi, uh, v tensor w as one object. So if you, if you apply psi v tensor w, comma z, so regarding v, v tensor w as one object and braid it past, that should be the same as first braiding the w past the z, and then braiding the v past the z, and then regarding as one object again. So those are normally written, if you write them out with, with your diagrams with the phi, you'll get excellence. Okay, but in our language, this just says that it behaves like you might expect for string. And similarly here, if you regard w tends to v as one object, and braid it past, so this is psi v comma w tends to v, you get the same as if you break it up into two different transitions. And from those axioms, you can show that, in fact, the braiding obeys the braid relations, which is why the notation is well justified. Now, the other thing is that um, when I say that these are natural equivalences, that means that they behave well with respect to morphisms between objects. So if you, for example, braid uh, V, uh, if, you, if, you, if you apply a map, a morphism, from V to some other object Z, V to Z, and then braid the Z past the W, you'll get the same answer as if you first break the, the V past the W and then apply the morphism to that part. Um, so that, so similarly on the other side. So that, those are statements, this is a statement that, that, that this is factorial. And, but in diagrammatic language. Now what this tells you is that you can pull, you can do algebraic operations, which I'm going to do as morphisms. You can pull them through break crossings as if they're beads on a string. And also, this tells you that you can do topological type manipulations. And just to round off the picture, not every object has to have a dual, but if it does, we say the object is rigid, and that means that there's an object V star, called its dual, and there's a morphism 
from um, v, ten, v star tensor V into the identity object. Now, I, I'm not denoting tensor products, so neither am I denoting the identity object for this tensor product. That's just nothing. So there's a map from V star tensor V into nothing. Similarly, uh, there's a co-evaluation map, which is a little bit less uh, familiar. Obviously, we're familiar with V star and V having an evaluation. But if you've got a finite dimensional object, then you've also got a canonical object going the other way, which is you choose a basis, EA, and a dual basis, FA, and then you've got a canonical object, sum over A, EA, tensor FA. So that's what this co-evaluation would be in the category of finite dimensional vector spaces. It's, it's, can, it's canonical. If you change the basis and change the basis here, the, dual, the corresponding dual way, this object is invariant, so it's a canonical object. Um, now, the axioms obeyed by, by the evaluation co evaluation are that, I believe uh, Berkeley has a graphic of this in the next talk, but if you, if you do um, that and that, and if you pull it up, pull it tight, you'll get a straight line. If you pull it so you'll get a straight line. But similarly this way. So these are the axioms of a, of a, of a rigid object. So we've just translated the axioms, which are, are around, have been around since. 86 in this case, into diagrammatic language. And now we'll start to do algebra in this diagrammatic language. So what is an algebra? Um, an algebra, of course, is an object in the category and a map from V tensor V, V tensor V into V. So in my diagrammatic language, I will draw it like that. The two bits of information from V flow together, and that's the morphism. I could, I could write it as a box, but I don't have to write it as a box. I'll just write it. Uh, as a in shorthand, uh, rather writing a blob there, I'll just write a dot. So that that's a particular name for that particular morphism from V tensor V into V. I'll denote it by a, by that join. And then there's also something that's going from the the identity element of a unit on algebra. If you've got a unit, the unit element. Since we're thinking categorically, we should think of it as a map from the trivial object into V. But of course, we're not writing the trivial object, so I'll just write it like that, from nothing, eta. It's a morphism from nothing into B. And then the axioms are the obvious ones. So associativity, I haven't drawn it because uh, so I thought maybe I'll put it here, but it's obvious. Okay? This is associativity. If you multiply and then multiply again, you get the same thing as multiplying on this side and multiplying again, going down the page. Okay, so the first lemma which we need, uh, it's not complete, so that, all that's completely obvious. Not completely obvious is if I've got two algebras in a breaker category, then I can tensor product them. And so what's the tensor product? The tensor product is shown in this box here. So here's the product, I, I use the braiding to take C past E, and then I take the product of B and the product of C, and I get something in B tensor C. So that's a map from B tensor C tensor B tensor C, into B tensor C. So that's the product on B tensor C. And here is a proof that it's associative. You use the functoriality to drag that morphism through that braid crossing. That gives you that. And now you use associativity um, in here, in B, and use associativity in C to restructure those trees. And then you use, um, then you could just use functoriality to push that back up. And now you see you've got the product going the other way. So that's the proof of the product. So now once you've got a tensor product of two objects in your gradient, of two algebras in your gradient category, you can define the notion of a Hopf algebra or a quantum group. And because these are um, in a gradient category, I call them gradient groups, probably much to my regret. Um, they're also called Hopf algebras in gradient categories. Uh, and what they are, are they're going to be an algebra like that, but also something going the other way, called the coproduct. So the coproduct will go from B into B tensor B. So it, it unmultiplies things. And in fact, having a having a hop algebra restores uh, a completely restores the symmetry in which you can take any proof I'm going to write down and turn it upside down, and you've got a proof of the same of another theorem, maybe the same theorem. Um, everything's going to be symmetric between turning things upside down. Because we've got products going down the page, reading down, and if we're also reading down, this is a co-product, but we could turn it all upside down if we wanted, but maybe I'll do that later. Uh, 
Now, you've also got to have something analogous to a unit. So it'll be like a unit, but it'll be going the other way. So this will be a map from B into nothing. It's called a co-unit. So that, that much will be a bi-algebra, and then we'll need something else which plays the role of inverse operation. To have something like a group, to really do group theory, you need to have an inverse. So that's just going to be a morphism S from B to B. Okay, so those are the ingredients. And what axioms will they obey? Well, the co-product will obey the same axioms as an algebra, but turned upside down. So please imagine that turned upside down. That's the axioms that the co-product obeys. Um, that's called a co-algebra. But what else do we have to have? We have to have that the co-product is a morphism from B into B tensor B. So the co-product should be a morphism okay, from B, but a, morph uh, a homomorphism of algebras. So if I multiply here in B first, and then I apply the co-product, and then I, uh, uh, right, so if I multiply in B first, and then I apply the co-product, I should get the same answer as applying the co-product to each piece, and then multiplying using the, the tensor product algebra, which was the one that we had in the last lemma. So that is, the, that is the diagrammatic statement of B being a homomorphism of, of algebras from B into the algebra B tensor B. But the co-unit should also be a homomorphism. So if you multiply and apply the co-unit, same as applying the co-unit to each factor. Um, the unit axioms, the unit, the statement of the identity is just that you can prune off the, um, you can prune off this eta and just get B to B, the identity. And that's, so that's a pruning axiom for a unit. And the same thing upside down for the co-unit. And then the final one is for the antipode. And this says that if you, so this is the most mysterious one. If you apply the, the cobra of the split link of the two, apply this inversion operation, and then multiply, you get something trivial. And just to motivate that, you can take an example, these are not going to be trivially braided, just the group algebra of a group. Here the braiding is trivial. And so what I'm saying is, and the co-product, delta G, on any basis element, is just G tensor G. So the way to read this diagram in this example will be I'm saying I take G, I split it into G tensor G, I apply the unit, the S, which gives me G inverse, and then I, then I multiply up. And that should be the same as something trivial, which is to say the co-unit just be 1. Okay. So that would be... So this diagram would translate for an ordinary group in the case where the braiding is trivial, it can't be vector spaces, and, and that, the object is just a group algebra, would translate into the usual axioms of an inverse, that g inverse times g should equal 1, similarly on the other side. Okay? So now, this theory works, and the fact that the theory works, is, this, is, this is the great thing, is things do not get tangled up. And there's no reason to believe that they wouldn't get tangled up, um, except for being obvious. <coughs> Uh, so, the, the, um, the, here's, here's a lemma, one of the first things I proved about this, was that you know that if you have a group, if you multiply, if you take the inverse, then that's the same as H inverse G inverse, right? Everybody in this room knows that property of group inversion, okay? So this is the analogous statement here. I haven't got a laser pointer, so excuse me. Um, if, you, if you multiply and then apply this inversion operation, this antipode, you get the same thing as applying it in each factor and then using the braiding to swap them and then multiplying. And this gives a non trivial braiding here. Okay? And how does the proof go? Well, I, um, I take that, I insert this thing. This thing I know is just trivial. It's going to be epsilon and a unit which I can prune off. So going from there to there is just the statement that the antipode loop, this GG inverse loop, is trivial. Then, the same, then again, I insert another antipode loop, this loop here. This loop is trivial. I can cancel it, put epsilon here, and unit here, which will then, then just disappear, and I'll have this one. So here's another antipode loop. Then, I use the functoriality to pull this over across that one. Something like that. And now I use the, I use the associativity, uh, co-associativity, and the sensitivity to reorganize the at the top and the tree at the bottom. That gives you this one. And now I recognize the, the homomorphism property of, a, of the co-product. So I can replace that using the homomorphism property 
by that. And now I've got another antipode loop, which I can cancel. So I've got a psion and a theta, which I can then prune off. And I've just got that. So, so that, is, that is an example, the only one I'm going to show you in any detail, of, of a braided algebra, a braided group computation. And um, just to round off things, you can have a if you think about hot algebra that I mentioned. Uh, you know about hot algebra. If you've got a five-dimensional hot algebra, then the dual is also a hot algebra. The same thing is true here. If I've got a left dual, let's say, for my object B, then I can use these this cup and cup cap that I defined earlier to 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 rotate to physically rotate the coproduct around, and that will become the product on the on the other side. And similarly, the product on this side, I can use these things to rotate it around, and it will become the, the co-product on the other side. Um, the antipode will be related, it's the adjoint map, and uh, similarly, the co-unit and the unit will be changed. So the dual will also be a hop, uh, a hop algebra, and then a radial group. Then you can do things like the adjoint action. Okay? So here's, here's an example of the adjoint action. So again, if you think of the group example, then this would be in the group case, if you just hit readers in the group case, we would have, I'll just uh, draw it, and then, okay, we have G, H, what we do, we have G, G splits into G and G, we have G inverse here, in the, in the, group, in the group algebra case, the rating is trivial, so this would just go past, G inverse, this would be H, this would be G, so I'd have G, H, G inverse. So that would be conjugation. But writing conjugation <coughs> in, the, in the theory of group algebras just becomes this diagram. So this is now the adjoint action. And you can show that it obeys all the properties you would want. It, it defines a natural um, action in the sense of uh, that you can, uh, you can extrapolate from what I've done. You've got an object in the Brady category. You can act on something by, by having a morphism. Um, so you can, uh, B can act on B. If I've got a morphism from B tensor V into V, which I could write as B V V, okay, uh, this is now this is now an action, and I'll maybe I'll call it some kind of blob here for the action, and and it should obey the obvious axioms that you, that you can imagine, like similar to associativity. So here is the action of the dual on the original. So this is this is left translation. This would be in geometry. This would be the action of left invariant vector fields. Of the enveloping algebra by left invariant vector fields on the coordinate algebra of, um, of a group. So, all of these things that you're familiar with in group theory and in, in, in the in Lee theory, you can generalize. Uh, here's a, in purple here is, is something unexpected. So, I mean, it's, it's not clear that everything does go through, but it does. Um, here's something unexpected uh, in a Brady category. Not, um, so, here's my alpha, this was alpha v. <coughs> alpha v. Um, you could have a notion of a module, uh, that is to say, a thing on which B acts, this is alpha B, but it could be that it's commutative in the sense that if you um, sort of flip it double, if you, if you imagine that the braiding with the double twist was trivial, you could replace this by a straight line, then this would be saying that basically um, this would degenerate into saying that delta was, was, was co commutative, that if you flipped it, the output of delta would be the same thing. So, so there, but that, that notion of being co-commutative um, really gets mixed up with the notion of being an act, a, a module of a certain type. So we call these commutative modules, and they form a, a braided monoidal subcategory inside. And uh, it's just an example of some of the things that you can start to do with this. Now, it's all very well having a general theory, but you've got to prove that these things exist. So is there is there an object fulfilling all these axioms in the, you know anywhere around? And so the, the, the main theorem I proved back then was that, yes, if you've got a monoidal functor between a monoidal, monoidal category and um, a braided monoidal category, and you need some, there are some technical things, but you need, you need this to be co-complete or else the result will lie in a co-completion of this, and you need, you need the objects, the image of, of every object in D to, be, to be, have a left dual. So there's the technical requirements, but essentially, um, given that data, there is a braided certain braided group such that this functor factors through the category of modules of B in B in C. So this object, this pair, alpha V, B, 
is a module. So I call that, it's a, it's a representation of B in the category, the object B is in the category. So I call this whole category of things um, BC, and this is another one of the category. And the theorem is, is that the, the, a B exists such that F factors through this, and this last set here is the forgetful function. So I don't, I don't want to draw on that, but that's an example of, that was the Bradius and Arthur Klein reconstruction theorem. But the main thing is, is that you have these objects. And when you apply this to the category C, is UQG modules. Okay, now, I recognize that for this audience, um, you won't necessarily know what these Drumfeld Jimbo quantum groups are, and you're not going to learn from me either. But um, there are these, there is, there is a, a basic class of examples of things called quantum groups, which are hot algebras. Uh, not, not finely graded ones, just ordinary ones. And they're associated with every semi simple the algebra G. And they have the amazing property that the category of five dimensional representations of them form a braided monodal category. So that's, that's the kind of example within which invariants of three manifolds and invariants of knots uh, take place. And that's why quantum groups give rise to invariants of three manifolds, because they generate a braided category. And so if you apply that theorem, with the identity functor, C, C, by the identity, apply this theorem, you'll get a certain canonical object, which I call B of UQG, which is a braided group, one of the things I've been talking about, which lives in this category, and which has many nicer properties than UQG itself. In particular, it turns out to be self-dual. Uh, it will be self-dual when Q is a root of unity and you take the five-dimensional version. But other technicalities, these things are self-dual. So, so somehow, Looking at the braided version gives you something very natural coming out of it. And just to give you one more example, um, if you've got any object in a braided category, in this time it can be a verb of helium, so you can take direct sums, then you can take the tensor algebra on V. So this is just 1 plus V uh, plus V tensor V plus V tensor V tensor V, v etc. And then you can, um, and then you can, on that, you can build a coproduct which on V is just 1 tensor V plus V tensor 1 on, on, uh, on an element V of V, if V has elements. But uh, you can say, you know, you can assume everything is k linear if you want, and, and concrete. Um, but, uh, and, it, uh, and then you can take quotients of that, and these give, you, give rise to greater linear spaces. And the example which you may have seen in other places is the quantum plane. So the quantum plane is an algebra with just two generators, x and y, with these relations. So it's like polynomials in two variables, but instead of commuting, the two variables Q commute. There's a parameter Q. And, uh, and this object is a Hopf algebra, is a Brady group. It's a Hopf algebra in a Brady category of UQ SU2 module. So the simplest example here is G is SU2, or SR2. And in that category, acting by rotations of X and Y, lives uh, this quantum plane. And here's what the cobra looks like on a general monomial. Okay? And um, all you need to know is these binomial coefficients are defined using Q integers. So the Q integer n, Q squared, is 1 minus Q to the n, well, 2n in this case, over 1 minus Q squared. So you use that to do, so every, so the, the analog of an integer is a Q integer, the analog of a factorial is a product of those, and then using those factorials, you can define the Q binomial coefficient. And so this is just a kind of tiny glimpse of quantum group theory, of Q a theory of Q-deformed objects. And you see that these braided spaces, the simple thing like a plane, play a very fundamental role, and they are exactly governed by this braided algebra. Um, I think uh, I will just tell you, yeah, for this audience, perhaps I won't dwell on these, but I wanted to show you a couple of non-trivial examples, applications. And I'll move on from this fairly quickly, so if this is too much to take in, don't worry about it. Um, I don't know why this is such a uh, bad quality, it's my PDF here, but anyway, so one thing you can do is Fourier transform. So Fourier transform um, is like this, you take the canonical element, this x is actually just the co-evaluation element, the element which I had written on the blackboard here, this element here. That plays the role of the exponential. So you take uh, the element of b tensor, b tensor b star, and you take an element b in b, or, take, or rather you do this all as maps, but well, imagine that B has elements, you take an element of B, you multiply it with the first leg of the exponential, and then you integrate, you apply this integration. This integration is, is, a, is a morphism from B 
into the unit, into the into the into the trivial object. So we're writing it as a, a map going into nowhere, and it should be have be characterized by left invariance. So there's a notion of I haven't told you this, but because we've got a, a group-like object, there is a notion of a Haar integral, and you can prove that in a bidimensional case there is a unique up to normalization translation invariant integration. So you have this object. You can then evaluate it against this canonical object, which is the co-evaluation of all the x, and that gives you the Fourier transform from B into B star. This is the Fourier transform. That's in this box. And here's a lemma which proves that this Fourier transform does the main thing that Fourier transform should do, which, it turns, which is it turns the differentiation, which is the action of B star on B. Think of B now as functions on a group. And if you multiply by, if you have an element of the Lie algebra or something in the dual, then it should it should act if you turn a function to another function, which is which is the left left invariant derivative. So it's the, so this is the analog I mentioned. There was an action of B star on B. If you do that and then apply Fourier transform, you get the same thing as applying Fourier transform first and then multiplying in B star. Oh, there's a star missing here. Um, so, 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 it, so it turns differentiation, or this particular action that I told you, into multiplication. And that's the main reason that we do Fourier, Fourier transform. Now, uh, the, an application would be, you take this Fourier transform, you take the category to be the UQ G modules, uh, except that I'm going to take, okay, this doesn't actually matter, but technically we take what we call the reduced version of the unity. This is a five dimensional version of, of the nth cuneiform enveloping algebra. Um, and its categories are <laughs> uh, and you take the identity functor, or if you like, you take the graded version. So you take the graded version I told you about. And you, you do this Fourier transform. So you've got this canonical Fourier transform on B. And in a particular case, there's something else called the ribbon structure. I'm sorry, there's quite a lot of, of jargon here. But there is another operation called ribbon structure which gives a rise to another one. And then ST together um, gives you a representation of the mapping class group of PSL2C. What, what I mean is it's curly S curly T, Q is S squared. So, so this gives you um, uh, a natural, this, this, and then this is what's used in constructing three manifold invariants. So there's a whole history there, but what's really going on, it's not presented this way usually, but what's really going on in construction of three manifold invariants is this gray group. And we've used here that B star is isomorphic to B, so, so that S, the transform is used as an operator. And that's with the self duality I mentioned. Okay, the other example, uh, just to tie it in with classical mathematics, is you take um, B to be the vector space spanned by the two cycles in the permutation group SN. And this, is, this can be viewed as a, a graded uh, object, object in a graded category, which is the category of cross SN modules. Okay, so, I'm sorry I'm skipping over all those definitions, but you take basically a graded linear space, you take tensor algebra, divided by some relations. And there is a sort of, sort of idea of maximal relations uh, in this case. And, uh, in, and that gives you a certain quadratic algebra, which turns out to be the fermi kurilov algebra, which comes up in another context, in, in purely classical mathematics, as a way of enlarging the cohomology of the flag variety. So the cohomology of the flag variety is a commutative ring. Uh, but by embedding it in a non-commutative one, uh, fermi and kurilov were able to make it quadratic. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the uh, fermi algebra. And that is the, uh, class, it turns out to be an example of one of these graded linear spaces. And then you can use all the theory of graded linear spaces. So it's just exa two examples where you make non-trivial contact with non-trivial mathematics. Okay? Now I'm going to return to trivial things. So, um, so uh, here's a trivial thing. Um, this is octonians. So, um, I think there's a lot more can be done with this, and I picked this because it is elementary. Um, so the category is going to be the category of Z2 cubed uh, graded spaces. So Z2 cubed means a vector, but the entries of the vector are in Z2, Z mod 2Z. So Z2 cubed uh, means an element of that is a pair, A0, A1, and A2, where these are, AI are in Z2, which is to say Z mod 2Z. Um, so I'm, I'm, um, I take that as my, and then given any two objects in that category, if I've got uh, two objects, V and W, and I've got elements V and W, then each of them will have a grading. 
because that's the I mean, a homogeneous element. So, well, sorry, I'm going a bit too fast. An object in this category means uh, means v will be a direct sum of pieces a in z two cubed v a. That's what it needs to be graded. So it's vector space that's, that splits into pieces according labeled by the group. And so if I've got um, and if if v if v <coughs> lies in a homogeneous component v a, we say that the degree of v is a. So that's the notation. So, uh, um, so if I've got two elements of homogeneous degree, V and W, in their appropriate spaces, um, then the braiding is just to flip them, except to give a minus sign if they're linearly independent when viewed as elements of this vector space over Z2. So I'm regarding Z2, this group, <coughs> for this line, I'm regarding this group actually as a vector space over the field Z2. And then if they're linearly independent, I get, a, I get a minus sign, otherwise I get a plus sign. So it's like a kind of super category, except that it's not super, but you get plus or minus sign. You get a flip with a sign. <coughs> but the associator also has a sign. So again, three elements will associate, the bracket will flip, will go on the other side, with a 1 if they're linearly dependent, or minus 1 if they're linearly independent. And so that gives you a very nice braided monoidal category. I, it's when I say braided, I'm a bit cheating because here psi squared is the identity, so it is braided, but the braid, but the psi, the braid crossing and the inverse braid crossing coincide. So it's not a very good example of a strictly braided number category, but it's anyway, it's a nice, it's a, it's a nice symmetric number category. And in this, in this very natural category, live the octonians. And I'll tell you what I mean by live in a second. Um, I mean I define them already. They're an algebra in this category. So here. So my construction of them, or I mean, my construction of them, Helena Albuquerque, is to take them as a real vector space with basis E A labeled by elements of my group, and then the product is as follows: If I want to multiply E A basis element with E B basis element, I just take the basis element of the sum. This is the addition in Z two cubed, but with a sign, and all the minus one to this. This is all in the exponent. So whether it's a zero or one is all that matters. Um, and this is a bilinear part, which is this vector, this vector um, with entries in Z2, and this other vector, so if you like a transpose, this matrix B. And then this cubic term here. And, um, and then this has the property that, I mean, technically this is a sort of cochain and its co boundary is, is five, but I don't want to go into all that. This, what this gives you, that, that's, that, that's it, right? This is the product. So I've got a basis, and this is the product. And I claim that that is isomorphic to the octonians. And but if from this point of view, it's an algebra in my in my category, and actually it's 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 actually a commutative algebra. And what I mean is is that if you apply in this basis, if you apply psi, and then apply the product, you get the same thing as applying the product. And here it's uh, it's also associative in this category. So and that I mean that it's associative, but you must insert phi. So, um, in the only way that you can. So, in this point of view, the Octonians become a commutative associative algebra. And, uh, which I think is a nice point of view, because we never like, wanted to work with non-associative algebras. Okay, um, now I think I've got time to, I've got much time. I'll give you one more application, which is sort of more current. I'm bringing you up to little things that are more current now. Uh, but the definition goes back a long way. The problem which I wanted to solve then was, what is the Lie algebra type object which generates UQG? UQG are these horribly complicated algebra with relations that I haven't even told you because they're too complicated to write down. Uh, but what is uh, the Lie algebra, the five dimensional thing that generates them and obeys much nicer, simpler axioms? And here's what I came up with for the braided Lie algebra. So it should be an object in a braided category. It should have a, a, some kind of bracket. And it will actually, but I require also a co-algebra. So I also have this delta and the we're now familiar with is a co-product uh, co-algebra. And then this should be the co-algebra should be a homomorphism in the same way as I discussed with braided with braided groups with respect to the product. So it should be a homomorphism. I think we're familiar with that now. And then additionally, these two axioms L1 and L2. And all I'm going to say, this one you recognise from the commutativity thing that I had before. But uh, just, just some complicated axiom, which we don't have to worry about. 
This one, I'll just give you the classical example, then you'll see where it's coming from. The classical example will be obviously the category of vector spaces. L would actually be one, if G was an ordinary in the algebra, then L would be one plus G, and sitting inside the envelope in the algebra, so one plus G dimensional subspace. And the coproduct will look like this, you see why you need the one. And then the bracket would be the Lie bracket of G, and then extend it to the one in this way. And then you will fulfill these axioms. And why is that? Well, let's look at this one. If you have x, if you have x, y, and z here, x will fit the two pieces. So that one piece will be x here and a one here. The one will do nothing. So you'll end up with x bracket y bracket z. But there'll be another term where you will have one here and x here. And so that will be x on z and, uh, and uh, y on 1, which would be nothing, and then y. So you have y bracket x bracket z. So there'll be two terms there, and there'll be one term there. So you've got three terms. That will be the usual Jacobi identity. So this will reduce the Jacobi identity in this case. But this makes sense in general, because obviously you haven't got something like Jacobi identity, because that, would be too, that wouldn't work in a very category. Okay. Um, and then you've got the fundamental theory is, is that you do have, in the opinion case, you do have an enveloping algebra. So given one of these great Lie algebras, you can take the tensor algebra and divide by these relations. I'll take this and co equalize it. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, and then the most important thing is for us is that you have a killing form. So you apply the bracket twice and take this graded trace. You've got, to make sense, to have an L and an L star, you've got to have a flip. So that this is L star here and L here. Um, so that's the killing form. So you've got these notions. And then the theorem is, is that uh, all the UPG do have such an object. And what's more, U of L maps onto UQG subjectively. And that means that UQG is generated by L, modulo sum relations. So that solves the algebra problem. And you can also go ahead and classify other, there, there's a natural n squared dimensional one for each semi simple the algebra G. They're slightly larger than you might expect. Uh, and the killing form is non degenerate. And then, um, I think I am running out of uh, time, but. Uh, <coughs> I'm not running out of time? I'm too half. Okay, great. You're giving me the extra five minutes from starting late. Well, uh, 25. That, no, that's brilliant. Okay. So, um, good. So, okay, so, so that's one side of D theory. Another side of D theory is geometry. And I'm just bringing my way towards something to do with geometry now. Um, in geometry, we think of the algebra as really the tangent space of the identity, or if you like, the dual of the cotangent space of the identity. So, the way we do, not, we do geometry these days, at least uh, most people do, uh, over any algebra which could be non commutative, so non commutative geometry, um, is you, just, you define a space of one form directly. So, rather than talking about differentiable structure, you just say, here is my bimodule, my A is my algebra, which is like my coordinate algebra, and here is my space omega 1, which I shall decree to be the space of one forms. And of course, you should be able to multiply from the left and the right, so that's what's called the bimodule. So, if you multiply um, a differential, an element of omega 1, by C and then by A, you get the same answer as doing the other way. So that's called the prime module. There should be a map from A into one forms, which turns a function into a differential, so that, and that should obey the Leibniz rule. And you see here that we're using the prime module structure, because we're multiplying here on the left and here on the right, well, right and left. Um, similarly, we should generate all differential forms like this, through D. And for a connected manifold, you would normally have the kernel of D is just the constant function. So that's an optional connected transformation. Now, in the quantum group case, uh, so again, I haven't really defined, well, I defined in gradient groups, so if you do it in a, in a category of vector space, you have an ordinary quantum group. Um, in that case, you can show that the translation invariant differential calculi are a free module over the space of invariants. So this is the space of invariant differential forms. And omega 1 can be constructed explicitly by taking the kernel of the co unit, kernel of epsilon, divided by some ad stable idea. And then the theorem of the if you've got one of these differential calculi for the kind of quantum groups like UPG or the other like Gurian algebras, then you will get a differential calculus. So, that's so you will get a graded Lie algebra. So that theorem connects the geometry to the notion of Lie algebra. And just as a spin-off, I want to show you what fun you can have. And if you take all of this theory and you apply it to a finite group, okay? And you might think well, that's going to be trivial, but actually the grading will be trivial now. But it's, you still get a very non-trivial theory. And uh, so in this particular case, the, the classification of right invariant ideal would just be 
unstable subset, so if you like conjugacy like classes, but any unstable subset in G minus the group identity. So that's how and the specific formula for the differential. The algebra now is functions on the group. Given the function of the group, the differential is given by right translating but in every direction in my conjugacy class um, times a phase element, which is the differential form in that direction. And these differentials, they don't commute. So F times EA is not, uh, you can't take it past, it will get changed by right translation by A. RA means right translation. Um, so now, if you work out the corresponding gradient E algebra according to that theorem, it just has again a basis labeled by your unstable subset, and it has a co-product which is group by. It has a trivial braiding in this case, and it has the lead bracket looks like this. So bracket of A with B is conjugation. And then it has a kidding form, um, which works out like this. So it's the it's a particular, it's a particular trace in the adjunct representation of product AB. And the you might now Here's, here's, a, here's an idea. Firstly, if G is a simple group, then you might expect that the killing form should be non-degenerate, just as a simple Lie algebra has a non-degenerate killing form. So you might conjecture that KL is non-degenerate. And then the other thing, which is true for a simple Lie algebra, is if you take a, simple, if you take a Lie algebra and it's simple, then it's actually the original representation. So you might think, remembering that L was C plus the classic Lie algebra, you might expect that L has the form C plus an era. Now, that's actually not true, um, but if it was true, it would be a fantastic result that we would associate an era to a conjugacy class. And that is, a, that is a holy grail, or one of the holy grails in finite group, because you, you're familiar with this by SN. By SN, the conjugacy classes are labeled by young tableau, and so are the eras. So there is a kind of, there is a kind of identification, but that, and they've got the same number. There are the same number of characters as there are conjugacy classes, so it's very annoying that there is simply canonical identification. And this gives you a clue towards the possibility. So this work is not, I'm just, because of the computer laboratory, I thought I would um, point out that these conjectures, I haven't got any theorems, or very few theorems, but with uh, uh, my co-authors, uh, we have been looking at the conjectures on the computer, and also we've proven some things. So we've proven that for a simple group, well the conjecture is, is that the conjecture is always not degenerate if the conjugacy class, if the unstable subset is close under inversion. And we've proven this for the universal counter, so that's a particular example. But we've actually, uh, for every, for every, well not for all G, but for all G where a certain rock property holds, and this includes all the sporadic groups, and all, and basically all except a certain number of, a certain except, number of exceptional cases of, of this type. And then, but we've also proven it by computer for all, um, uh, up, to, up to all the 95,000. So it does seem to be true, and, and um, for, all, for all the conjugacy classes. So um, that's the conjecture. The, and then also, it seems that, if, that very often, just as every classical D group has a compact real form, um, it does seem that in all these examples, you have at least one which is where K is positive definite. And uh, so again, that's been proven by, by computer. Uh, I'm going to skip through the data. The last thing, that, thing is that you can take the group algebra, and set, you can take the Lie algebra, uh, the conjugacy class C, which is like the algebra, and you can decompose it uh, under the Killing form viewed as an operator. And then, well, then the eigenvalue decomposition will give you a kind of decomposition of the of the Lie algebra. So I, I said that it wasn't quite as simple that L decomposes into C plus an era. However, using the Killing form, we can decompose L into all its irreps, uh, generally, generically. And so, for example, here is a spectrogram of or the killing form viewed as, a, as an operator, uh, much like, like the hydrogen atom. Looking at this sort of bar chart tells you um, what the eigenvalue is for each of, see there are, there are three occurrences here of the 55 dimensional representation. This is for the natural representation of that. And, uh, and at a certain eigenvalue. So it's, let's just say this is a, this is a new, new way of thinking about uh, finite simple groups and their classification. Um, I think I'm going to move on from that. The last, um, well, yeah, I do want to say that this idea of having a bijection also seems to be true, but we're really lacking. There are many, there are many more, there are, there's more than one way to do it. So the, what seems to be true is that for every conjugacy class, you can, um, you, can, um, you can view it 
as defining a gradient linear algebra. And then inside that, you will find um, a number of error apps. And you'll be able to choose, a by, by looking at the errors that you find, you will always be able to find a bijection. You'll be able to choose a bijection between conjugacy classes and error apps. And this bijection is not the obvious one in the case of SM given by Young Tableau. So, uh, but it's always possible. The problem at the moment we have is there are too many. We don't know which is the most natural one. But it certainly seems to be possible that you can do this bijection. Okay. Uh, the, okay, so that was, that's, that's current work in the sense that this paper came out recently. And uh, I think there are lots more things you could do if you're a computer scientist looking at such objects, finite geometries, associated with finite simple groups. Now, the last topic I would, uh, well, maybe the last topic, is, is geometry. I've told you a little bit about differential geometry already, not really geometry. Now we can go back to the beginning of the talk and do all of that differential geometry, but do it in a Brady category. Okay? So I'm, what I'm, I'm going to combine the things I began with about graded hot algebras and the things that I touched upon about non computer differential geometry, and I'm going to combine them by doing differential geometry in a Brady category. And so here, the, a, a manifold will be represented by an object, by an algebra. So he will typically be um, an object in a category, that should be an algebra. And the first thing to do is to define the space of differential forms. And you can just define n forms, uh, one forms, or you can do n forms. And the way that the universal calculus is defined is if you take the n plus 1 tensor powers of P and you take the adjacent maps, the adjacent product maps, you've got a whole, you've got P tensor P tensor P and you can multiply here or you can multiply here or you can multiply here, etc. So you've got n different products that take you from here into, there's a run out of Thing, but it's meant to be P to the N, so I'll write it. P uh, tensor M plus 1 into P tensor M. Pro multiplying in one spot. Um, then, um, on that space, you can find a differential. And the differential um, is defined by, by this diagram. So the category has to be abelian, so we can write down direct sums. And, uh, and, makes, and we also make sense of the interpreters, but that's not a big deal. Um, so, D should be the, the identity plus, well, it's only the identity in different places. Okay. So, you can do that. Then you can define, so that's the notion of exterior algebra for the universal calculus. You've got to then work a bit harder to define something that's not the universal calculus. Then uh, we can define now, we can define a principal bundle by saying, well, I've got some, some group, some gradient group in my gradient category. And I've got P, an object here. That means that the P is 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 a, is, a, is active, or in this case, co-active. It's a co-module under B. I see that I haven't defined co-module, but um, it's just the same notion as a module, but with all the arrows reversed. So a co-module means a map from uh, here, written with a black triangle, from P into P tensor B. And um, I define the invariant one of that co-action to be the, the algebra which is the base space. That makes sense in any in, in, in then I've got this map chi, which I view as a map from P tensor P over M into P tensor B, this map chi, and I require that to be inversible. And that plays the notion of local triviality in differential geometry. And once you've got that ingredient, then you can define a connection and a splitting of the cotangent bundle. So a splitting means I've got a projection operator, chi squared is chi, and I want the kernel, its kernel, to be the horizontal forms, the forms that are really forms on the base, um, like that. And then the theorem, the, the only non trivial, first non trivial theorem, is that such splittings, abstractly defined connections, correspond to connection forms. Now remember that B plus is now in, in the language today, uh, at this stage, we're talking about co actions. B is like the functions on, it's like the dual of the Lie algebra. And um, so omega, this is like a Lie algebra value one form, because that it's a map from the dual of the map from B plus into that. So that would be the analog of a connection form in differential geometry. And given a connection form, I can define pi. And using the inverse, I can go back. So that gets you off the ground on the theory of quantum principal bundle in the graded sense. Um, the, I'll just look at, I want to only make one observation about this, which is that um, there, are many, there, are, there, there is a notion of a trivial quantum principal bundle, 
which, I, which, is, which is typified by, not the only one, but typified by this. But P is of the form M tends to B, right? So normally a trivial bundle in geometry would just be a cross product manifold. So, that, so here P in algebraic terms, P is M tends to B. And um, here the coaction on P is just given by applying the co-product of B. That's, the, that's this coaction that I mentioned. And there's some maps, phi and phi, just given by these formulas. But in, you could have a slightly more general notion of trivial bundle in which phi was not given by these formulas. Anyway, in, when you've got a trivial bundle, in a connection form, obeying all the properties that are correspond to a connection, uh, can be obtained from by this formula from an arbitrary A. A is a map from omega from B plus into omega one A. So this is what this is what we call a gauge field. The gauge field in physics, if you do gauge theory, is a Lie algebra value one form. And now it's on the base manifold. Uh, in you know once you fix your local coordinates. So that's what we've got here but written a little bit backwards. And now the basic ingredient of gauge theory is that uh, first you've got to cover a derivative on any, on any um, form value um, sections. And this is given by, uh, by this D operation, which is the same thing we had before, plus the action of the A. And then there's something, this is the curvature of A, and this is DA plus A squared. So these are formula familiar to you if you know a bit of physics and you looked at gauge theory, except that I'm doing them all with diagrams. And, uh, and um, if you remember blowing down the page, and if you do a gauge transformation, you can take a gauge transformation now similarly in local coordinates would be a, a group value function, or in our case, a map from B, which is like on the group, into M. So, uh, and then given the gauge transformation, you can transform a section into a new section, transform a connection into a new connection, a gauge field into a new gauge field. And this, this is your familiar conjugation plus gamma inverse D gamma. So this is a, uh, so these are all the formulas that you're familiar, familiar with. And then everything transforms covariantly, in particular, the curvature transforms by conjugation. So in this way, you can do gauge theory uh, at the level of diagrams. And my point really here is, is that this has not really been exploited. I mean, you can do, people do this stuff in, in a, in a, in a, in a, or in a, with a trivial, in a trivial, in a category of vector spaces, we do quantum group gauge theory. But apart from this paper that I wrote some time back, people haven't really done it at this level of generality. But the theory is very general and could work even when there are no vector spaces in sight. And in fact, what's really quite remarkable is at this local level, this local gauge theory level, you don't even need a braiding. This is really some kind of planar algebra that's going on. Uh, it works in any one little category. And that ought to be used. So rather than just talking about usual operations on a monodal category, you can start doing geometry on gauge theory. Okay. Now I've almost finished. Yeah? You want to stop there? Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. I'll stop there. And that was the last one. Thank you very much.
Stock will be given by the Fasa, from Oxford, and no, from the Oxford. Okay, thank you. So I was given the task to tell you something about continuous structures, and I have to give a disclaimer at the beginning that nothing what you see here is actually new or it was done by me. It was, everything was stolen from the literature and from some people sitting in the room. So, also, in trying to prepare this talk, um, I noticed that the topic for Venus algebra is so vast uh, that um, I have to concentrate on something. So, I will try to concentrate on this one, because this is your favorite uh, example. Okay. So you, you know this uh, type of thing in the Frobenius structure, you want to get rid of these uh, banded lines where you actually want to do this. I, I want to uh, exemplify a little bit why and when you can do this. This is a special focus on not using algebraically closed fields. Okay. So a little bit of history. Who invented it? Frobenius. Algebras obviously were invented uh, to some extent by Frobenius. And um, the archetypical graphical thing which we want to construct is this type of move, which uh, I also, by the way, like Sean Minashik used the tender diagrams in the pessimistic error of time, reading downwards. Yeah. Um, so here you have this type of product and co-products. And Frobenius hit on this problem when uh, actually studying the character theory of the symmetric groups. Uh, you have a left regular and right regular uh, action, and you want to know uh, under what conditions the left and right regular actions are actually isomorphic, so that they give you the same representations. Another thing which we have to consider, or which comes into place, is uh, Finite Hopf algebras, and they were invented uh, by Heinz Hopf. If you look at the original paper, it's not so easy to find the Hopf algebras in the Hopf paper. And uh, originally, what was called Hopf algebra in the early days is actually nowadays a Bi algebra and so on, so it's, it's not easy to find it. But the, the archetypical graphical thing, what you also saw in the very glad chant in all these pictures, yeah, uh, is that you have this product and co-product, and now you have a different kind of compatibility law, which actually in this uh, guy says that the algebra is, uh, the, the product is a, a co-algebra homomorphism and vice versa. As Sean also has pointed out, there's a horizontal symmetry you can turn it upside down. Okay, and um, here you demand that the identity is invertible under this convolution product, and that is just undeclosed as shown, as already shown. Yeah. So, uh, what you actually want to do, um, you let K be a commutative ring, uh, maybe finite field or whatsoever. Uh, and you pick some generators, so all modules which I look at have to be finitely generated, so I can pick a set of generators. It will, will turn out to be a, a central part of the structure. So you may safely think of the group algebra of symmetric groups. And then from the multiplication of two generators, you get what you would call a multiplication table. And from the multiplication tables, you can manufacture the left and right regular uh, representations by just fi fixing either the i or the j. Then you get a, a two-dimensional array, and these arrays will enjoy a matrix multiplication type of uh, product, and that is a left or right regular representation. And Frobenius asked himself, okay, uh, these things look very different eventually. When are they uh, identical, and you have a third type of uh, choice, you can fix the K, then these things no longer form a representation, so uh, you cannot multiply them, but you can uh, 
just form uh, by picking some parameters AK, uh, what's called a parastropic matrix. And the original theorem of Frobenius is that if this parastropic matrix for some choice of AKs is invertible, so the determinant is non zero, then the left action and the right action are actually the same. And that's a, the archetypical uh, definition of Frobenius, and you can see that there are many more. So, as an example, take the polynomial ring in commutative X and Ys factor out this ideal and you can prove that is Frobenius but not everything is Frobenius if you take the same polynomial ring and factor out this ideal you can show that this parastrophic matrix will be singular and it's not Frobenius happily um, so matrix algebras over division rings are Frobenius so, so that is a very wide class and use much yeah. now I, I have to focus on some things uh, which are this topological move and you saw this also in Chan's talk so I will just skip this slide and go to the diagrams so we have this evaluation move and this co-evaluation move and I, I put the orientation on it because in the case you have these ratings and these things you will have also a, a left evaluation and a left group evaluation like you have a right evaluation so here I'm taking the Islamic reading order versus the Christian or Western one yeah so um, you, you have these two type of things if the category is uh, actually symmetric then you can flip the lines and see that these evaluations are actually the same and uh, the, the main thing of this uh, evaluation and co-evaluation is that they fulfill this topological move and this is not the yanking move of the movie at the beginning yeah? it's a different type of thing it's just a duality in this category and you get it for the duals and for the vector spaces in case the thing is braided you have to be a little bit more careful because uh, then you should look at these things as ribbons but you can use uh, the Weidemeister 2 move, so move this a little bit to the left, bend it by this type of move, move it back, then you come to this image, then pull this down, you come to this image, you use uh, the functoriality, as Sean has explained, to move this up, then you use um, the, the other oriented move like this, uh, pretty print it and you get this one, where you still have this twist left and this twisting is uh, a ribbon element in, in this phase. I do usually write the symmetric tangles and not this one. Now, uh, to approach the Frobenius, uh, we should look at bilinear forms. There's another way to, uh, uh, to construct dual elements. If you have a non-degenerate bilinear form on, on some space, vector space or projective module then uh, under the condition uh, I will only look at regular associative bilinear forms a bilinear form is associative if uh, the bilinear form of A times B with C is the same as the bilinear form of A times BC and I always always assume it's non-degenerate yeah? so we can try to classify these things um, and we can call two of these bilinear forms uh, identical if they are homothetic. So you find a non-zero K and a, a symmetry of, of this bilinear form. So that such a relation holds, you would not call these bilinear forms essentially different. It's a base change in the scaling, so to speak. I call a bilinear form symmetric if it's symmetric. Yeah? I have something rather weird, that is, if the thing is not symmetric, then there exists an automorphism, it's called Nakayama automorphism, so that when I flip the entries, I get the action of this automorphism. And of course, if the automorphism is identity, then that is symmetric. And just to show you that this automorphism has some weird features, if you have a symmetry acting on B, you can define the transposed symmetry with uh, respect to the bilinear form. 
but the transposition of the transposition needs not to be the vector space itself, but the uh, uh, automorphism action on this vector space. And only if this is uh, uh, automorphism of finite order, you can come back to uh, the original. Another thing what you can manufacture from uh, these bilinear forms is what's called a Frobenius homomorphism. That's if, if I plug in a 1, either in the first or second slot, uh, then I can construct a linear form on A. And this linear form is obviously symmetric if beta was symmetric and it's a trace form. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in a graphical way, the associativity of these uh, betas actually look like this. You, you can plug in the product and you can just move the thing on the other side. The linear form is just manufactured like that. And okay, here you see uh, the, the, the symmetry if it actually works in the transposition. Okay, now you can use duality for p linear forms. So uh, you can manufacture these left and right actions uh, now using the beta just by letting A act via beta on the vector space. And um, now we can actually dualize our vector space with this beta and define something which is called a Frobenius system. So a Frobenius system for A is a triple from which is a bilinear form, a set of Xi's, so I did not print the set brackets here, yeah. a set of Yi's such that for all A in A this uh, relation is true. Uh, so you can look at this beta if you are a physicist as a reproducing kernel or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and this is our Yankee group uh, where we use this bilinear form and not the duality. So, um, at, at this point, yeah, okay, we wait a moment. Actually, um, Sean has already pointed out um, this thing here, that you find these generic elements for the duality, and you want also to see if there are generic elements of the same type, but from this beta dualization, so to speak. And that has to do with separability, so I have to pause a little bit. Actually, this is a slide explaining what Sean has uh, uh, said about uh, differentials. So I can safely skip this to have a chance to finish my talk. So what you actually need to know is that you can manufacture on a module uh, a derivation. You want to get the Leibniz rule. Um, you can for any m find an inner derivation which acts like m and m is a bimodule uh, by the way and dm is zero exactly if that is an a invariant in m which is this condition and then you get a sort of exact sequence so zero to the a invariants to m to the derivations and you can actually construct an ideal uh, of these inner derivations and um, then we can look at something as a definition of I've skipped the definition of AE so AE is an enveloping algebra A tensor A op where A op is an algebra with the product uh, slip so, um, what you can do is to apply this HOM to the ex uh, exact sequence and you get this Hochschild homology 1 and the, the, the thing what you actually want to say is this theorem for K algebras, A is equivalent to say that A is projective as a left A E module that means especially that you find a finite set of generators for A um, and that this sequence is split that means there is a morphism from A into A tensor A op so, so that uh, this splits as a direct sum 
there is an element E, uh, which in the Swedler notation is E1, E2, in A tensor A, so there's no star here, yeah, such that A uh, is uh, fulfilling this type of condition, that the left multiplication on A is the same as the right multiplication on A. That means this E is an A invariant in the invariant algebra, and that the sum, if you multiply this, uh, is 1, and such a thing is called splitting item potents, and this plays the role of this relation of Okay, then there are some, some consequences which you find, for example, in the book of Cartesian on any decent text on continuous algebras. So that the, the separability condition is actually the same as you saw before in algebra, before, if, if you just let, look at ordinal text in algebra. Now, there is a, a tremendous list. I think there's a paper of Ostwig in listing 12 definitions of uh, or equivalent characteristics characterizations of Robinius algebras. I have picked a few of them. So uh, the following is equivalent. A is Robinius. Um, the left and right regular representations uh, are equivalent. There exists A in uh, K to the N such that uh, the parastropic matrix is invertible. There exists a regular associative linear form and a Frobenius homomorphism lambda. There exists a hyperplane of A that does not contain any non-zero right ideals. There exists a Frobenius system, and that's the most important for us because that will allow the yanking at the end. Yeah? Uh, this a Frobenius homomorphism and uh, this lambda is the composition of the product with the beta, so to speak. And um, there is the splitting item potent, which is uh, Central in this sense, and many more things. This is by far not the only thing we can say to characterize continuous algebra. So now, um, I actually promised in the abstract somehow to come to the Jones item potent, but it will not happen. I just have not in the time. Now. But uh, what you actually want to do is to extend this not to algebra, but to, to rings. And you want to look at rings and ring extensions. Uh, so you look at uh, a ring extension so that you have a homomorphism from S uh, in, into A. Set of A is the center of A. Um, so such a ring extension is an algebra uh, if this S is a commutative ring and E factors through the center. But that has not been to, to, to happen. General. Uh, a over S is central in, if it's I of S is the center and proper if, if it's I not wrong. So now we can look at the uh, categories of S modules and A modules, say right modules. Yeah? Um, and you can look at the restriction functor where, where you uh, just uh, restrict the A action to the S action. But you also can uh, construct induction functors, if you like, the adjoint and co-adjoint versions, where, where you allow this, act, this error to go in the other way and where you extend the action on the module. Um, and now you can prove that uh, these two pairs, T and R and R and H, are adjoint pairs of functors. And this gives a very important definition a ring extension uh, is called a Frobenius extension if H and T are naturally uh, yeah, H, sorry here, that should be H yeah. I'm sorry about that, yeah. so my restriction from those R is, this is H uh, it's a typo, so if H and T are naturally adjoint functors from MS to MA and that has a certain type of consequences, especially once more we get this Frobenius homomorphism <coughs> and we get this x, y which form our splitting item. And this is a starting point if you want to read about such things, for example, taken in the book by, I'm not sure if I can pronounce his name, Stefan Kanepil, I 
Yeah, Militaro and uh, Zoo, uh, where you can study Frobenius functus on uh, module categories, and that has many important consequences. But I cannot go into this. Uh, I want to go back to the tangles. So the lambda multiplication, um, we, we use a couple of isomorphisms which we can establish. The endomorphisms on AS can be written in this way as A tensor S uh, A star for right and left S modules. And then the multiplication uh, is done by using this co-evaluation, uh, this evaluation map. That is the this evaluation which was used by Shan. In the sense that every endomorphism has a tensor product representation by an element in A and the element in A star. <laughs> And you can act uh, just by acting this f on b. And then there's a theorem that the Frobenius extension with a system lambda x and y, then uh, you can produce uh, an isomorphism between a tensor a, not a star, and end a s as rings. So especially you get a new type of multiplication on this, which is called lambda multiplication on A. And the lambda multiplication, so I use for composition the semicolon here, yeah, is that you have this element in A tensor A, and this element in A tensor A, and now you do the same trick as here, only you multiply the things by using the Frobelius homomorphism. Okay, and, uh, okay, you, you once more have this uh, element E, as some of those, and we had seen that we could define isomorphisms of regular associative bilinear forms by these homotetic transformations, and you can show that if you are given a Frobenius system and an element D in the centralizer of S in A, invertible, then all other essentially different Frobenius systems are given by lambda d, xi, d to the minus 1, yi. So that gives you an overview where to look for particular um, different Frobenius systems. And this uh, d, uh, so, so in the centralizers, that has to do, if you look in a different way on it, onto the module of trace forms uh, and the Cartan map in the Gordon D ring of, of, this, uh, that, of these module categories. So that's an important way to look at different Frobenius. Okay, now uh, the Frobenius multiplication and the yanking, so uh, actually why it works again, yeah. We are now in the position to produce a different type of multiplication on uh, these endomorphisms. So we have this multiplication from our Frobenius algebra, and we can now use uh, in two ways uh, the, the structures which are given to us. In one way, we have this AF and BG, and when this information or whatsoever you think of it flows down, we can use the evaluation here. Yeah? And then we just get an element of the endomorphisms again. On the other hand, we can now use uh, the A tensor A picture, where all the orientations are down, but now we have to use the B linear form from the Frobenius algebra to just close up these two tangles, and we have another a tensor A element, and the key fact uh, why this works again, so what we actually want to do is we want to, uh, we want to simulate this evaluation, co-evaluation thing here. So we have this type of topological move uh, for the evaluation and co-evaluation which come, comes true in any rigid tensor category which has this type of tangles. Now here we have the same type of thing, only that we use only downwards going uh, inform 
information flow. And sometimes uh, you see this confusion with electrons and positrons, are they moving uh, in forward in time or backward in time? Yeah? Um, or you, you possibly know this type of tangles from the local people. Yeah? Uh, you see this type of things. And then there's this information flow. We saw in the morning this type of uh, linguistic things where you had this information flow going through these boxes here. And here always there, there is a sort of discussion if the information is flowing up and down. And you see the Frobenius structure is exactly what tells you that you are allowed to use a bilinear form, a non-degenerate associative bilinear form to model this type of relations. Okay. Now, the last few minutes for Hopf algebras and Frobenius algebras. So, Sean has told you lots of things on Hopf algebras. So, um, K is once more a ring, but a particular ring. I don't go into this, uh, it's just a technical condition. I have this core unit, I have the integrals which Sean has explained. So, so the tangled version of the integral is just like this. And from this integral, you can construct a right norm. And um, you should be careful if you think of uh, quantum computation. It's easy to show that Clifford algebras, for example, don't have this type of structures in general. Um, now there's the famous uh, result of Larson, Sweetler, and Paragis, that if H is a finite projective Hopf algebra over K, um, then there is a right Hopf module structure on H star. And the, the most important thing for us is there exists a left integral, that is uh, UL, such that you can construct such a theta from H to H star, defined uh, using the antipode and this integral. So that this is a right Hopf module isomorphism. And the, uh, the antipode is bijective, so there exists a, in, a linear inverse of the antipode, not a convoluted inverse. And H is a Frobenius algebra with a Frobenius homomorphism. And the crucial thing is that uh, these integrals have to exist. And of course, finite <coughs> And once more, you get then this type of uh, move. But now you here have the product. You use this co-product, this, this uh, E element here. Yeah? And you can use it both ways. And possibly up to a grading, and uh, this here is then a definition for the co-product of the Hopf algebra. So you can cook up the co-product out of these structures. Okay, here are some consequences and differences between uh, similarities and differences. So if you look at the Hopf algebra, there's this famous Cooperberg letter. So if you look at this type of, of up and down move, you find easily here by putting here antipode, you can uh, use associativity as Sean did it, then you can disconnect this as he showed that these antipode loops uh, vanish and get the identity showing that this tangle is invertible. Yeah? Now, um, what you also can see is that these two tangles have the same characteristic polynomials, so they have the same uh, non zero eigenvalues, so that they only differ on the kernel. The same is true for the Frobenius ones, so, so the Hopf are the, the right ones. Yeah? So you see that the Frobenius yanking uh, cannot be invertible. Yeah? So the, the Frobenius thing is totally different from a Hopf type of thing. Now you, you find a sort of bi-algebra property, if I did this correctly, you just use Frobenius, Frobenius, Frobenius and a little bit rewriting, and you get this type of tangle, and so if this loop is one, that means the Frobenius algebra is called special when you get the bi-algebra axiom for, from the Frobenius structure. Okay, so there's a qubit view on the Clifford algebra. I told you Clifford algebras are different. And that's a pre last slide. Yeah. Um, so what you can look at, say, I look at the real Clifford algebra, the complex numbers. And I get the generators, not the matrices yet. Yeah? And I get some idempotents. Then I get a regular eight-dimensional, because this algebra is eight three dimensions. 
representation, but I get also a center seen as the real uh, complex, uh, the algebra of real algebra of complex numbers. And then the spinors in these Clifford algebras are actually uh, left ideals from these projections, and the left ideals have a left CL3 and the right complex number action. And on the spinner space, uh, that is an uh, irreducible matrix representation, you have a Frobenius uh, structure. So you can look at this matrix representation and you can cook out the ordinary trace on these spinner modules. You get your splitting idempotent, which uh, projects on the complex ring here, not on the reals. Uh, and you can cook up a Frobenius product and a Frobenius co-product. And okay, nobody is stunned here where they say this is just copying of the basis. Yeah? Okay. Now, I hope that this talk has taught you somehow to understand why you can use this quantum teleportation protocol using Frobenius structures. Yeah? So, uh, you all know this, yeah? uh, how Bob actually does the trick. Okay. So, here is, uh, if you like, but I don't go into this, uh, this where you could go, if you would like, and what I haven't told to you, and it's quite a stunning on this time. And that's to where I took and stole everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, half past one.